Once you suspect that you've got ME-CFS, it's a really tough road to walk down, not just because it's hard to find people to care for you and there's not just like one straightaway treatment that gets you back to being feeling normal. It's also hard just because the diagnostic criteria aren't super clear, right? So you start off with energy levels, fatigue, pain, post-exertional malaise, meaning like I do, I exert, I do activities, and then I'm tired thereafter. You've for sure tried every blood test. You've for sure had an MRI. You've probably seen some type of immunologist or rheumatology or maybe even cardiology or neurology, right? All the ologies. But all of them kind of end up in this kind of ethereal space of like, well, you just have to like you have to pace what you are doing. So like do less than is your optimal or stay within your energy envelope. And while those things make it way easier to be able to kind of survive day to day, it does not make it easier to be able to move toward uh, like a compelling future. What kinds of things can we actually measure to take this thing that feels invisible, that feels like no one believes you, it's all in your head, and start to turn it into things we actually measure in the body. Because when we have those, then we can start to do trials where we can actually attempt say, we're gonna do these things therapeutically. We're gonna see if we can expand that energy envelope to be able to push that level up and be able to regain some function in your life. And there are two things that have um, been shown recently that, that'll that blow your mind. So number one, there was a study in 2020, so it's actually five years old now, and they found that when they do an orthostatic test, this test that we, that we see happen in these autonomic sim- syndromes like POTS and orthostatic intolerance, but we do this test where we do a simple tilt test looking at transcranial Doppler, and we find that 90% of those people in that study have impairments of cerebral blood flow velocity. So what does that mean? It means that when you go from laying down to being upright, they are losing the blood flow into the brain. So it's kind of like if you were to imagine every time you get up, you have someone just kind of like chokes you and then you just wander around like that. Actually, there was a study in 2018 that is kind of like preemptive to this that was published by Peter Novak. He was looking at this with orthostatic intolerance patients. And and what a lot of people will notice about ME-CFS is they'll say, I have orthostatic intolerance, but I don't have the tachycardia. I don't qualify for POTS. I don't qualify for orthostatic hypotension where my blood pressure is going down. I'm kind of in this gray space. And that's exactly what I started to notice when we started to test these things, was that we would find people where they don't meet the qualifications for POTS. They have maybe a little bit of tachycardia, but nothing crazy, or maybe none at all. And their blood pressure stays relatively normal. So like, what do you do? But we actually found with Peter Novak noticed that he was seeing normal blood pressures, normal heart rates, but drops in cerebral blood flow. And that's exactly what we see in a lot of cases where we're having this disconnect between how we're generating pressure in the body and how we're transferring that into the brain. And that's a huge clue because it lets us see that if we're kind of choking areas of the brain, number one, energy is gonna be terrible. So we think about all of the mitochondrial issues that people talk about, like, oh, it's mitochondrial dysfunction. If you can't get oxygen into your brain, there's nothing to churn through that mitochondrial factory to create energy on the other side. So you might as well just have empty factories sitting there because you're not able to drive the fuel through them, right? So you can't create the ATP. So you can take all the supplements you want. If you can't get oxygen and glucose into the system, doesn't really matter, right? So that's number one. But then number two is, the distribution of where that blood flow changes is going to be different person to person. So as I start to augment blood flow into the brain, some areas may be able to take use of that blood flow more than others. So we start to see discrepancies in function where maybe some things work okay. You know, maybe um, you can be upright and your vision doesn't get blurry. You're like, you're one of those people. I see fine, like those are fine. I don't get dizzy. But other people may notice like, I get super dizzy and my eyes get blurry and then I can't see colors right anymore. I get these blotches in my eyes. And some people are like, I can't do math. And other people are like, I can't write. So you start to see all of these disparate areas that can be affected. And if you start putting them all in little Venn diagrams, you see that 
for a lot of people, they overlap, but they may not all overlap to where it creates this like perfect clinical picture. It can be very distributed. There was a study in 2014 that it looks like cerebral blood flow is actually the thing that preempts problems with hypoxia, problems with CO2, problems with sympathetic changes in the outflows. They actually come after the problems that we see with cerebral blood flow. So it's this huge, huge thing. And unfortunately, in ME-CFS, for whatever reason, because of the symptom constellation, it doesn't point us toward, hey, we need to look at that right away because it's so diffuse, because I have pain and problems in my joints and problems in my muscles and all of these other areas. Sometimes we forget to look at that main computer that controls the whole system. There's a second piece of data that's also cool is what's going on with the levels of CO2. Additionally, people with ME-CFS have been also been shown to have low resting levels of CO2 that get worse with orth orthostasis or being upright. As we're making ATP, that factory gives off an exhaust, you know, like smoke comes out of the factory in, you know, in our plant in Michigan. The smoke that comes out of a mitochondria is going to be water and CO2. And the blood vessels are actually able to sample for the levels of CO2 through simple reflexes and control distribution of blood flow into the, the smaller arterioles to be able to control that. So if I have cells that are really active, let's say I'm doing like a math problem and I'm cranking out, you know, in this frontal area over on my left side, I'm going to see that those neurons are going to re are going to produce more CO2, which is going to drive more oxygen into that area. So as CO2 levels go up, we get dilation of the blood vessels in the brain, it pulls more blood in. But as CO2 levels go down, it's a signal that like, hey, nothing's really happening here. We don't need to augment and send a lot of blood there. We're pretty cool doing what we're doing. So as CO2 levels drop, we actually see constriction of the vessel, which makes it harder for your heart to pump blood into your head because there's more resistance. And this is a huge problem in people with ME-CFS. What's interesting though, is the levels that they might experience when they're laying down may be normal, but when we tilt them up, we see that as cerebral blood flow drops, also we see drops in CO2 and we get something that's called hypocapnia. And that hypocapnia can happen because there's changes in the vasculature in the brain or because our breathing rate changes as we're upright. Either way, it's gonna create all of the symptoms that we normally have around cerebral perfusion or blood flow in the brain. These are the things like feeling lightheaded, feeling foggy, like you can't think, like your memory is poor, like your brain is tired, like your vision is blurry. Like this little constellation of symptoms that all kind of feel like, hey, I'm not getting enough blood flow in my head. If you find that you are just struggling, you don't know where to go, you've got this like thing I think is ME-CFS, maybe I need to look at what can I do from here? Those would be two places that I would start. And the good news is, is they can all be kind of done in one test if you can find people that do that type of testing. And then from there, we back out to say, what's causing that to happen? And we do further tests like looking at deep breathing tests and Valsalva tests and peripheral nerve examination and looking at the way your eyes move and the way your inner ear works and looking at how you move your body. All of these things help us to be able to build a skeleton around what is causing that in the first place. So one example like that comes to mind from a case that we have right now is a woman who has been dealing with this long enough to where the original diagnosis was fibromyalgia. And as you know, that's kind of like become a, a non-in vogue term, right? Like that's, that's fallen out of favor in terms of, uh, in favor of things like ME-CFS, which is actually more appropriate to what she has. And so she's been dealing with a super long time, lots of pain, but it's starting to become a problem with her balance, being able to get around, being able to be up and out and like doing things in her life. And it's creating a problem where she's down for days. And when she's up and moving around, she's having a problem where she's falling. And in that case, what we found was there was a profound drop in cerebral perfusion. So when she gets tilted upright on the tilt test, even though she doesn't necessarily feel that as her primary problem, we see this massive drop in the perfusion of her brain. This is problematic and she feels that. So when she's up there and she can't move her legs and kind of compensate, she feels really lightheaded, starts to sweat, feels foggy, feels nauseous, 
kind of all of the things that go with that. And then we come to find out that when we stress the baroreceptor systems in her neck, she doesn't have the normal ability to detect the changes in pressure. So when she comes upright, the normal sensors that detect the blood pressure in the arteries in the neck, they're not picking up a signal and getting it to the brain quick enough, which is why that blood's allowed to drain out. So the things that we've been working on are actually to increase the sensitivity of those baroreceptors in her neck, the pressure receptors in her neck, so that she's able to detect those changes so that when she stands up, boom, that blood, your, your brain recognizes that that blood flow is changing and the body can compensate and push that blood back up into her head. And it's this beautiful outcome because you take someone that wasn't even considering that this was a problem at all. She was more worried about her balance. Come to find out that if we can change that sensitivity of those baroreceptors, she starts to feel better. She's sleeping better. She's able to start going for her walks, moving around. All of a sudden, what she had perceived was this problem of, um, she didn't use these words, but these are the common words of her energy envelope. She knew she could only push so hard or she'd crash. She was finding that without any effort, she's able to just kind of like do normal things and she doesn't feel that immediate um, uh, punishment that happens with that. So I think that was the thing that, that was the most profound for her. So it's a wonderful story. We're still working on it, but just knowing that she's able to like go out with her husband and go for a walk in the yard um, without crashing and without feeling like she's going to fall over has been a huge win. And we're going to keep pushing that. But um, it's just an idea of how we can start to move away from thinking about things solely as this perpetual problem that will be with you forever and starting to maybe have a picture in your mind about, well, maybe if I can understand a little bit differently about what's going on, I might have some more options about how to address it. I'm gonna challenge that just gently, but I'm going to challenge it and say like, maybe there's another way to think about it. And if you're open to that, that might be a thing that helps you unlock and move forward and be able to solve the problem in a new way. So I hope that helps. Leave us a comment. Let me know what you think. I know this for some people, this is going to be a little shift in how you feel about things, but it may just open up a little sliver or a little crack in the door to head down a new road. And I hope that serves you.